the statement for uh, the So thank okay. you, very, thank you very much. I think uh, Marco, you take over. Yes, the discussion. Yes, yes. Okay. The first question uh, uh, I received is: uh, Do we have any morphological explanation for the clinically separated H and L types of lung condition? So. Um, uh, we have no clear um, answer to this question. Uh, the question was if we have an explanation for the specific lung um, uh, changes, yes? Yes. Okay. So here I think um, we need um, many cases. For the moment, uh, we have the situation that we all have experience only for a limited number of patients. Uh, this ranges from three um, cases per pathology to about uh, 20 cases per pathology department. So there is definitely a need to do a register or to organize a registers. We have seen these activities in Switzerland as well as in Germany that we um, uh, found a register which allocates the um, autopsies of COVID-19 patients. So this was one thing. The other thing what we have learned from these individual cases is that, that each case is unique. And um, we um, have, of course, in the pathology departments of a hospital, the advanced and very severe cases spending weeks in the intensive care unit. So the lung um, pathology is overlaid by um, the um, respiratory distress syndrome and the acute alveolar damages. So it's difficult to define a pattern of COVID-19. So in our own experience, from a limited number of autopsies and resection specimens, the um, um, something what was a characteristic and unique is this endothelitis. And this was the um, inflammation of very small vessels. And you have looked for these um, specific changes very carefully. And this was especially pronounced in the lung. So in addition to the um, um, alveolar damage, we have seen um, vasculitis in small vessels associated with a prominent apoptosis. And a similar picture we have seen also in small bowel resection specimens of COVID-19 patients who survived. So we think that this morphology is someone specific for a phase of the disease, but we have to better understand when and in which patients this occurs. I don't hear you. I, I, I think that the, the, the following question, uh, are you listening to me? We hear you, yes. Okay. The following question was related to Spain and says, are the changes in Spain introduced by local departments according to the Spanish pathology societies or enforced by national government? I think that like in Italy and in other countries, the Spanish pathology societies made recommendations and they were also adopted by the national government just as recommendation and the local departments take that took that information and, the, and you you have seen the vast majority of them adopted that these recommendations but we are a, a scientific society so i mean we cannot force people uh, but we can make recommendations okay the next question is we cannot understand you. Died of COVID 19. 
Can you please repeat your question? There was a technical problem. We could only um, hear your last words. Please repeat your question. We cannot hear you, Marco. Okay, so, maybe, um, maybe I can help. I, uh, yes. He's trying to, to read the, the next question. Is, is The question is, when we deal with statistics, do we know who did off and who did with COVID-19? So um, maybe um, um, I think everybody of us can answer this question. In principle, we cannot say <laughs> and we cannot tell um, because every COVID-19 patient has an individual cause of death. In my opinion, um, we um, should do autopsies and um, derive from the autopsy findings um, if a patient died with or because of COVID-19. Of course, if you have a very severe clinical symptom and a patient came to intensive care, um, for, it is sure that COVID-19 plays a leading role. Um, but we have to better understand the disease cause in patients who die at home. So what our um, in clinicians told me is, that they see patients coming into the hospital with very weak symptoms, and then they um, develop severe thromboemboli after a week. So this increased hypercoagulability with thrombus formation is a new situation what we have to better understand. And this could be a combination of this um, microthrombotic uh, um, formation. So what we call in Zurich, the in situ clot formation in the microvasculature, or the thrombus formation in the large vessels. Uh, we don't know if the virus directly affects the endothelium. Um, it can be also an indirect effect uh, during the phase of the cytokine storm. But again, we have too um, less experience with this disease. I mean, if I can add something, Holger, I would say that I think that the clinical picture of COVID obviously is heterogeneous, but you know, clinicians recognize patients that have. COVID-19 and died because of COVID-19. So there is a subset of patients in which they, they died for COVID. But then there are other situations, you know, COVID is infecting patients with cancers, with leukemia, and you know, and then, and then it's starting to have an overlap. And I, I think in some cases it's difficult to tell what has happened, you know, and as Holger said, probably in these cases, autopsy is going to be answering that. The next question <clears throat> concerns the average ages of deadly patient in Italy and Spain. What are the average ages of a patient who died of the disease in Italy and Spain? So uh, in, in Italy, uh, it's 79 years. That's the main age of people dying. It's different uh, if you concern the main age in, uh, for people in the intensive care unit, which was 62, which is ex exactly my age. I was very upset with that. <laughs> uh, but the mean age up to now, I, I just looked a few minutes ago to, in the uh, website of the um, Istituto Superiore di Sanità, which is our main uh, health institution, and it's 79 years. Thank that's you. that's and pretty you. much that's pretty much the same in Spain, and I think it's it's clear that age is a, is a, an important factor as associated disorders. You know, as it has been mentioned, you know, diabetes and so on. Uh, 
so, but it, the, the, the figures are very similar to Italy in Spain. Okay, the next question uh, is relating to the differences uh, in autopsies between uh, a patient with uh, COVID-19 and patient with usual seasonal flu. I think it's uh, difficult to, to answer. Can you please repeat the question? The question is, what is different between autopsy in patient with COVID-19 and uh, in patient with usual seasonal flu? So it's difficult to answer. Um, <laughs> we have very uh, poor described um, morphology images from uh, the uh, seasonal <clears throat> flu um, uh, cases. I just realized here a um, thesis from Zurich on the topic, the Spanish flu in 1918 and 19. The autopsy reports of more than 970 autopsies from the Spanish flu. So I'm convinced that these findings get a new um, emphasis in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the next question uh, is, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, is uh, what do you think about mutation D614G? This is a molecular question. <laughs> yes. Is there anybody who is able to, to answer? Uh, is it a mutation associated with a genetic predisposition? Um, so there is a couple of mutations like that. And uh, now people are working on this kind of... Uh, genetic predisposition of different mutation. Uh, so it's a, sometime we can have a higher, higher risk in some, uh, some individuals because we, we can have some uh, cons constitutional uh, mutation, but there is a lot of mutations. There is also mutation on some genes associated with autophagy, some SNPs, some polymorphism, um, so it's a very, very large subject. So uh, I think one mutation maybe is not enough to, to be sure that we can be associated with a higher, higher risk to develop a, a severe disease associated with the COVID-19. Okay, the next question is for uh, Mattia uh, and... Uh, uh, the recommendation uh, to the use of uh, DPI like FFP2 or 3 masks? Well, I think, uh, I think the question was also about the, uh, what you have to do with uh, unfixed samples. I think it was, I, I just, because I answered to this by, uh, uh, through the system and probably this is a reply to me. So uh, the original question is how, if the uh, infection spreads through droplets, why should we care about uh, unfixed samples we are going to uh, cut at, in the grossing room? And I reply that this is um, the problem is because of uh, surface contamination and also possibly uh, when you open the jars, uh, you can uh, produce uh, small droplets. So. One of the questions we have to probably think about as a pathologist, as a community, is that there, I, I, personally, I'm not really convinced why we have to use biosafety cabinets, Clever 2, because uh, I'm using chemical um, cabinets, we just uh, bought two of them, which have been tested very uh, thoroughly uh, about uh, the Airflow 
and they extract all the airflow uh, inside the hood and they completely protect the personnel from air coming out of the flu uh, of the hood so uh, my uh, um, impression is that uh, biosafety level two cabinets which protect the inside of the hood from our viruses which we can uh, 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 spit inside uh, are not useful or are not needed for our activity once we have a properly functioning hood which extracts the air outside our lab and with HEPA uh, high particulate filter, uh, filters which protect also the environment. So I think we have, we, the international agencies says, say we have to work with PCL2 uh, uh, safety level, which does, uh, may I share the screen just briefly, uh, if I can, uh, to show you, um, uh, can you see the screen now? No. No, we see your oh. face, but not the screen. Sorry. Uh, anyway, if you go in the uh, laboratory biosafety manual of the WHO, um, the requirement for a biosafety cabinets is indicated as desirable, not as something which has to be done, uh, uh, to be used. So uh, the um, biosafety level two is something we. Uh, um, how to say, it, it's a strategy, a general strategy. So uh, I think that uh, we, we do not, we should not focus on the problem of having biosafety cabinets level two uh, in all our department, which is not the situation actually in Italy. We, I think we only have these, I, in, at least in my lab, I have a small one for the molecular laboratory lab where I have to protect the product. Which I have, where, where I do uh, um, uh, molecular activities. So I think mm, it, it's something we have to think about uh, because biosafety level two uh, can be reached also with other type of uh, cabinets, provided they are properly functioning and there are tests which has to be done. Also tests with um, potassium iodide, which um, can uh, assure that no particles came out, uh, which is a test which is used for biosafety cabinets. So yes, this I my, can uh, say something, this is Paul for Hoffman. Uh, I agree, I totally agree, but something very weird is a heterogeneous uh, practice from a lab to another one, from a country to another one. And for example, I was with John Gostney from Liverpool yesterday on the phone, and in UK, they use uh, a BCL3 environment, not two, in Liverpool right now. So um, I am very concerned about uh, the discrepancy uh, from a country to another one, from a, a, a city to another city. And I think there is an urgent need to try to set up uh, not a white paper, but a white position uh, in the European Society of Pathology for that, because uh, you know, we we I mean we need to be sure to use the good the good uh, cabinet the good safety procedure. Okay, we can move on. The next question uh, is: uh, Have there been any IUFD autopsies from COVID positive mothers? And if so, did anybody see? correlating changes in the placenta? I, I have looked at a series of, a small series of cases of placenta. I haven't seen any specific uh, alteration, but... Uh, so we have tested all placenta specimens over the last um, uh, eight weeks, and all of the placentas were negative for COVID. And um, what I've heard from our obstetric clinics was that even mothers with COVID had a, only very weak symptoms. There were no um, severe symptoms. Okay. There is another question concerning the role of smoking, because in the beginning was identified as a risk factor 
but now there are indication of a preventive impact. This question comes from a smoker. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a female. <laughs> okay. Uh. No, in principle, um, we don't know. Uh, I would rather trust the data. Uh, and these are the huge um, uh, studies uh, published this week in the New England Journal of Medicine where you have these associations. And the only um, protective associations for the disease cause are um, statins and um, ACI blocker for the hypertension. And the um, predisposition is clearly obesity, um, um, hypertension, and the others, and also smoking, and we argue that this is damage of microvessels. And this would also explain uh, the diabetes. So diabetes is one of the high risk um, factors. And this is of course uh, also uh, damage of microvessels and this consecutive um, thrombotic formation. So, and coming back uh, to the um, placenta, uh, what our clinicians report is that also patients with organ transplantation do relatively well. So, um, and we think that this um, hyperinflammation, that there is somehow an autoimmune disease and the um, uh, um, transplantation um, and immune um, compromisation uh, probably helps the transplanted patients to get better through the COVID-19 uh, disease. Thank you. The, the next uh, question is uh, to the executive committee and council of the ESP. And uh, is the ESP planning a registry for collecting information on COVID-19 patients? I, um, I I um, um, have um, watched now the activities uh, countrywide for um, these autopsy registrations. I think this is a very good attempt, but I think this should be done uh, on the national um, level um, because uh, there we have the national rules for registrations. I am aware that uh, the uh, lung Pathologists have an international registry trying to collect data from um, COVID-19 lung specimens. This is a very uh, good um, initiative, um, but uh, we have to think at ESP if it makes sense to have a European-wide autopsy register or an organ um, register. But this uh, organ um, specific register should um, come from the working groups. Yeah. Well, the next question is uh, uh, from Alish Riska. Is there any reported professional infection by coronavirus in a pathologist? No, I think um, um, Xavier has said um, there were. Um, 2% of pathologists, I, I hear it was 2.4% um, in um, Spain. Is it correct? We don't hear you, Xavier. It, it doesn't mean that they got infected by working, you know. They got infected. Obviously, when that the survey was was taken you know in the hospitals many people clinicians got infected and you know so the, the, this environment was probably prone to get infection but not necessarily working as a pathologist i think it's difficult to prove that a pathology has uh, gotten infection by working you know it, it's difficult to prove that you know. I can add the data from our hospital. Um, they monitored all the infections and almost all infections, the P 
people got outside the hospital. That's also in Italy, we have done a very informal uh, survey asking uh, you know, with our um, uh, mailing list where, whether there were outbreaks or uh, significant numbers of pathologists which got infected. And it was really uh, uh, a few numbers, uh, probably, which were infected outside the hospital. So no outbreak in any lab in Italy. Uh, the next question concern uh, if uh, there are uh, any indication of uh, endothelitis in uh, central nervous system. So I was asking um, our neuropathologists, they have seen um, these uh, central um, um, endothelitis in the central nervous system only in one of five cases. So it was rare. And, um, but our clinicians, they think it's more frequent than uh, we have seen this in our autopsy series. So, but I would be interested in these data. Um, they have seen also um, these um, inflammation, rare inflammation in these centers um, related to the olfactory system. And, but this law was not uh, um, localized in the micro vessels, uh, it was more outside, but in this area. Okay. And, yeah. uh, another question concerned how long should we uh, use these extra protective measures? I think it's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, even our governments do not know how long we have to keep in the phase two lockdown. So probably we should uh, be uh, very uh, uh, cautious with dealing with our, all our materials. But in general, I think that we have to change a little bit our mentality, shifting a little bit from the um, focusing about uh, a chemical risk and having a more comprehensive view of chemical and biological risk in all our departments. Probably there is an acute phase now where we are very, very, um, how to say, um, focused on, on this topic, but then we will never have to lose our attention on biosafety. I think this is a new uh, attitude we as pathologists have to uh, deal with. We have a, a comment uh, on, uh, on a related uh, issue. Uh, it comes from Sweden and they say that uh, uh, they have very basic hygiene routine and about uh, 550 pathologists in Sweden, none of them uh, had, uh, had COVID-19. So, in some way, stressing that uh, probably the use of uh, protective measures is in some way uh, something in, in excess. The next question uh, is, uh, in some countries, such as Spain, there is a lot of social pressure to perform autopsies on COVID-19 patients. Uh, the question is, could this result in decreased funding for strategic areas such as molecular pathology and the digital pathology? I think if I can give an answer, I think that's a, it's a good question, but I think, uh, for example, in my country, in France, I think there is no impact uh, for uh, the molecular pathology budget, of course. Um, I think it's, it's, it's not the same, it's, a, it's not the same goal, it's not the same budget, it's not the same uh, stakeholder. So um, I think no, definitely not. Um, for, for my point of view, there is no impact on, on the budget. Well, let, let me tell you, in Spain maybe, because the budget is not that different you know, and the problem is that if from now on all uh, dead bodies 
should be regarded as suspicious. And we have to um, or reorganize the autopsy rooms in all pathology departments. That's a lot of money. So that, that's something that in this, in this position paper that, that Paul was mentioning maybe has to be mentioned. Is that necessary that all autopsy rooms have fulfilled this safety or not? Just, I don't know, one each two million people, I don't know. You know, these are questions that uh, uh, we will have to try to answer, I think. Yeah, but in some countries, the autopsy, there is a centralization in some city. Um, um, so I know that in Switzerland is like that. It's, um, in Switzerland, we have a, a couple of cities where the autopsy is, is, uh, are set up and not in all the institution. Um, so, uh, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a good question, but uh, uh, we used to do, for example, in Nice, a lot of autopsy from each HIV positive patients, a lot of cases in Nice in the south of France. And uh, so our autopsy room are already set up to practice autopsy with uh, a high biological risk. In, in general, when we are doing autopsy, uh, I mean, we need to take care about uh, the contagiousness of the different samples. So I, I, I mean, we are doing the same practice for all the autopsy in my institution. You know what I mean? It's not because the patient is suspicious to have a COVID-19 infection that we need to increase our precaution because usually we are doing systematically autopsy with a lot of precaution in my institution. Um, we are doing cross felt jacob sometimes autopsy suspicious of HIV patients, infected, tuberculosis, histoplasmosis. So I don't know why it would be different. It should be different for the autopsy room. Uh, oh, Gustavo. These were the same arguments that we used uh, in our letter to the uh, Robert Koch Institute uh, when we stated that all uh, autopsies are potentially infectious and we uh, don't see that it's uh, more uh, uh, dangerous to, to uh, perform an uh, uh, autopsy on a COVID-19 patient than on a tuberculosis patient or a Jakob Kreuzfeld uh, disease. So we also use already many precautions in our institutions. And uh, I think that uh, some of the uh, recommendations are really exaggerated in this point. And uh, uh, we should be aware that uh, this is maybe due to the new disease. Nobody knew uh, uh, how it uh, contagious this is and how dangerous this is, but we should uh, critically uh, uh, ask if, if these measures are really uh, uh, necessary for the future. But Gustavo, if I can make a question. If I understood correctly, in German you have around 30 autopsies performed. No, so no, no, just the university hospitals perform 30 autopsies. This is, uh, there are not only uh, university hospitals uh, doing autopsies on COVID-19 patients, also other communal hospitals, uh, bigger hospitals who have uh, the possibility uh, for the for the biosafety, uh, of course, not the uh, general, not the, uh, uh, the, the uh, pathologists in private practice have uh, uh, these uh, these uh, measures, but uh, there are many other uh, institutions who can do it. Uh, and one point which is very interesting in Germany is that we have two cohorts of uh, of uh, autopsies. This is the clinical uh, part that we have in the university hospitals, like Holger mentioned, but we have also the series from Hamburg uh, where the health authority uh, mandated uh, all autopsies, also old patients who died with just a positive test, uh, example, in a, in a, in a private uh, uh, flat. And they were, uh, there the uh, autopsies were performed in the forensic uh, medicine department. And the head of this department stated heavily in the public that no patients died on COVID, but all patients die with COVID. And uh, I think this is uh, 
uh, a very uh, dangerous uh, notion because we all know uh, from our uh, severely ill patients uh, from our intensive care units that they die on COVID. And, uh, but maybe this is the opportunity to do a, a discriminatory study uh, on this uh, different populations. So, and may I add also something um, we have, I went through um, two phases. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen the pictures from Italy. Um, so uh, we thought to protect our people working in the autopsy room. So, uh, and we have a very well equipped um, biosafety um, autopsy room, also um, um, good for Jakob Kreuzfeld disease, where we are sort of a center for Switzerland. But in many community-based pathologies, um, they have not such a well-equipped um, autopsy room. And then the question came up, should we centralize all autopsies? Um, and at the beginning of the crisis, um, uh, I decided to do only um, the patients from their own hospital uh, because I was afraid that uh, my people uh, get infected. Now, after um, in eight, uh, ten weeks, um, we have uh, fortunately not so many autopsies. So, um, and I could foresee that it is more important for us to learn about the disease, to do also the um, autopsies from people dying outside the hospital, uh, especially to clarify the cause of death um, in these patients. This is one um, side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the uh, society pressure. And here I have to admit that all the media nowadays associate our profession again with autopsies. Uh, and we were fighting now for 20 years that we are doing biopsies and that we serve living people and living patients. So, and therefore, um, I gave an interview to the newspaper, to the NZZ, and to make clear that we do our normal work as pathologists as a, on biopsies, also uh, in the COVID-19 era, with and without COVID-19. And this is part of our profession, not to do only autopsies. Okay. <clears throat> There is uh, another and last question that is not really clear to me. Uh, I, I read what was uh, asked. Have you seen uh, myocardial Wuhan variants is in COVID-19 autopsies? So I don't know if uh, the question regards myocarditis or... Um, I have only a limited experience. We have not seen the typical picture of lymphocytic um, myocarditis, uh, as we know um, from other virus diseases. As far as I know, um, the larger series from Switzerland with 20 cases, they have also not reported the typical lymphocytic viral myocarditis. However, we have seen in our cases this intramural endothelitis, but in not a big um, extension. And in another case, the patient died on myocardial infarction. So um, you have, can have both. Okay, uh, right. an additional question. Uh, in a book, autopsy, 21st century, there is suggested maximum swabs from different tissue after standardized procedure, six to 12 hours molecular test, and later swabs from formal infixation. Could this be an idea to get autopsies reformed and more attractive also for the future across Europe? I think it's a good proposal for research purposes. Uh, we uh, did this also in different organs uh, to learn about the disease. 
Uh, but again, unfortunately, we have not many autopsies uh, here in central Switzerland. So therefore, um, it could be a way to, um, uh, to, to um, ask for registers and to make a standardized autopsy protocol. But in, uh, locally, there are different rules. And when we started with the crisis, we had not enough test kits. So, and I said, we don't do tests at autopsies because we had not enough tests for living patients. Now, the situation is different. We could do this for research uh, purposes. And it's uh, a very good idea to understand, better understand the disease especially when we have to learn how the um, antibody titter is developing and uh, all this, what is connected to the disease. There is no uh, additional question. So uh, I think we can move to the, to the final part of the, of the session. I mean to the to the conclusion and the uh, possible distribution of tasks. So in my opinion, I think um, um, the um, meeting here brought uh, light to many important topics. I have learned a lot. Uh, at first, I learned uh, how to perform a virtual meeting. <laughs> and um, this is probably what remains also after COVID-19. Yes. Many of us will use this platform um, in the future for our conferences. I know that the Germans uh, will do now a virtual meeting. And I press my thumbs that this will be a success. The European Society of Pathology has decided to do a physical meeting in Glasgow. We have postponed our conference. And I hope, I strongly hope that um, we can do it and that we have not to cancel it because of the second wave. Again, the Spanish flu, we did more autopsies in Zurich in the second wave than in the first wave in 1919. So um, I press my thumb again that we will have not a new crisis in December and that we can perform our um, society meeting in Glasgow. Um, personally, I want to thank all the speakers. I think uh, you brought up in many, many important tasks uh, one task is a standardized version of uh, autopsy, maybe to write a white paper. I have learned a lot about molecular pathology and specimen handling. This uh, I will immediately um, um, bring to my people um, that uh, we have to communicate to our people how to handle the probes and how to make these safety regulations. So thank a lot uh, to you. Paul, and um, to all the audience, I want to thank, and at the end, I also want to thank AstraZeneca to make this possible. We collected a lot of experiences, and I could foresee that we will use this platform also for other occasions and for other meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can leave the meeting. Is this correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we can leave the meeting. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.